sometimes if you're patient and lucky, the gaps in a story can be filled in over time. And that's what has happened for me in regards to Harry and Meghan's exit from the UK and also the subsequent Sandringham Summit and all that that involved. It's been really interesting for me. Robert Jobson's book, which I reviewed, and I reviewed it before the coronation, so my focus on that review was about Prince Charles. And I guess I was a little biased because I guess I was looking for feel good about Prince Charles leading up to the coronation because there'd been so much angst about will Harry go or will he not go, will Meghan go or will she not go, and all the horrors leading up to that, that I just felt it was a real pity that it was just getting sort of destroyed in a way, although it wasn't affected at all in the end. But this was sort of the two or three months leading into it. So I think I was looking and reading Robert Johnson's book with sort of like blinders on and I was not reading anything about Harry and Meghan because I was determined not to make a video focusing on them. Because after all, the book is called Our King. So I wanted to make that the focus of the review. But I have since gone back and had a look because so many interesting things have cropped up for me. I've read Dan Wooten's uh, narrative of how he broke the Megxit, as he called it, story. And that sort of filled in a bit of a timeline for me. I also have re-watched Harry and Meghan's documentary and it's something that Meghan said that made me go, ooh. <laughs> And I've also gone back and read Robert Jobson's book and I've also compared what he said about the Sandringham Summit, which was very interesting, to what Valentine Lowe also had to say about it and the work of all the courtiers leading up to that summit. So I've got all these pieces just scattered all over the table and somehow, somehow I've got to bring them all in together to make a cohesive picture for you. So I'll attempt that now. Before I go into the meaty stuff, I just wanted to say that I did read a, <laughs> a thing that made me laugh in Robert Jobson's book, and I'm sure you already know it, and apologies if you do already know it, but it just caught my eye about Ross Barr, the acupuncturist, and <laughs> it's just a little few lines in Robert Jobson's book. Um, the couple were being treated by an acupuncturist to the stars, Ross Barr, in the lead up to the wedding. Barr's treatments dealt with anything from infertility to hair loss <laughs> and relationship problems. And oh, Robert Johnson, you are naughty. Like after, out of all the ailments that you could say that that poor acupuncturist treated, which I'm sure it would be, you know, over 100, 200 things that he treats, Robert Johnson had to highlight um, infertility, baldness, and relationship problems. I just thought that was a delicious bit of shade from Mr. Jobson. Now it's interesting, before Harry and Meghan went off for that R&R &R in Canada that Christmas, he did speak to the then Prince Charles about all his troubles and how the fact that they wanted to step back from royal duties and they wanted to spend at least half of the year outside of the UK, yet still serve the Queen for half of the year. And basically they wanted to be with their young family and step back. Now, the then Prince Charles sort of thought, oh, it's just Harry upset again. He didn't pay him a lot of credence. He, he was used to Harry letting off steam. Robert Jobson points out in the book that the then Prince Charles was really used to Harry mouthing off and, you know, getting it off his chest. And the then Prince Charles was used to playing that role of letting their child let off steam and he didn't really take it too seriously and he wasn't being proactive about it. He more or less said, well, look, you know, that's very difficult. I think the plan that you have put forward is not really feasible. Um, and, and anyway, it would have to be put in writing so that we could all discuss it. It would all have to be worked out legally too. So, you know, just talking about it could never come to anything. Thing. So that's how it was left and Harry and Meghan went off to have their Canada Christmas. Now, as you know, he was initially, it was agreed that he could meet up with the Queen, but then he was sort of <laughs> told, oh, no, no, we made a mistake. Uh, there's no room in the diary. Sorry. And how furious that made Harry because he felt like he was being fobbed off. And he was being fobbed 
off. Now that's when Dan Wooshan comes in because Harry uses the fact that Dan Wooshan was going to break the story of their exit from the UK as a reason why they put up that extraordinary statement on Instagram and officially more or less told everyone the way they were going to step away and how it was going to happen. And they decided that this was all going to work out very nicely for them. Now, it's interesting too that Prince Harry actually rang the Queen prior to issuing that statement and she was expecting something that was from both sides, from both voices, more or less saying that nothing had been decided yet but the family will come together and to discuss, to more or less fend off Dan Wooten's article, the seriousness of it, And that was pretty much what Harry spun her, that they were going to put out a statement that wasn't going to add anything to the funeral, wasn't going to add fuel to the fire, wasn't going to add anything that would be scandalous and would just basically say that it was all undecided and that that discussions were ongoing. But that's not what Harry and Meghan did. They took the gamble and they put out a statement saying, this is the way it's going to be. And full stop, basically. So they were calling the Queen and the then Prince Charles and Prince William's bluff. And they thought that they'd really back them into a corner. They thought that they were going to get what they wanted. They thought that they were in a position of power. Another tidbit that I found interesting in the Robert Johnson's book was that prior to the Sandringham Summit being hastily convened after Harry and Meghan released that inflammatory statement, was that the Queen actually had the room where the summit was going to take place. She actually had the room swept for bugs. Now, that is uh, a level of distrust. Now, it may not have been against, of course, Harry and Meghan, but there's a level of distrust there, isn't there, from within the palace walls. They may have been wondering who actually tipped off Dan Wooten. And it's interesting because after bringing all these pieces together, and this is just personal opinion, I think that the tip off to Dan Wooten came from someone a little closer to Harry than he expects. Because when you think about it, again, subjective, personal opinion, the only one set to gain from releasing that information early was Harry and Meghan. It gave them a bargaining power. It didn't benefit the then Prince Charles to release that early. It didn't. It didn't benefit the Queen to release that early. It didn't benefit Prince William to release that early. The the royal family were really on the back foot when that was released. And the only ones ready with a resounding statement of how they wanted things to be was actually Harry and Meghan. Now, I don't know if Harry was in on it, but, you know, how many times are we going to give this guy a free pass? That's all I'm going to say. So... An interesting tidbit. I told you that I noticed something about timelines. Okay, so I will read you what Dan Wooten said, which is his version of how the story unfolded and for his, in his words, quotes, Megxit article was first printed. So Wooten said this, Much has been written about how I broke the story of Megxit with the finger incorrectly being pointed at Clarence House and Kensington Palace. So they're saying that the couple liked, he's saying that the couple liked to promote the idea that they were somehow ambushed into revealing their plans. But in this article, he actually says that he approached them, he approached, he put the story to Meghan and Harry's office, their office, because don't forget they had a separate office, separate comms team at that point, and he gave them 10 days to get back to him before he published. Okay, so 10 days to get back to him. Now, in Harry and Meghan's docuseries, Meghan says, his dad said, just put it in writing and just five days later, it's there in the newspaper. So that means that five days before Prince Charles received their written notification, the story had already been leaked to Dan Wooten. And that's the thing. 
When you're spinning stories and you're saying things that are convenient for you and how you want the the public to perceive how things unfolded, it's very difficult to get timelines accurate, especially when you're dealing with a lot of moving parts. So Dan Wooten said he gave their office 10 days heads up. In the docuseries, Megan says five days after they provided the written plan to the then Prince Charles in an email, it was printed. So there's a five-day discrepancy, which also is interesting because it sort of coincides with around the time that Abigail Spencer was visiting them on Vancouver Island and she had done the initial heads up, the initial softening of the idea in October in People magazine, allegedly. So, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And it's also really unfortunate because if Harry didn't know, I'm just going to put it out there that, okay, hypothetically, he didn't know that the leak may not have come from Kensington Palace or Clarence House. It was on that basis that he was really furious with them. He, that, it was, that was the anger that drove a lot of the nastiness in Spare. It was the anger that drove a lot of the things he said in the interviews about Spare. It was his main point of contention against then, the then Prince Charles and Prince William. It was the fact that his family and the officers of his father and his brother leaked and briefed against him, that they ruined any chance that he would have had of moving to Canada as a Commonwealth country and spending like six months there and six months back in the UK, which I think was ideally what Harry wanted. Um, and that prompted his fury, that, that set him against his father and his brother to a far greater extent. So how unfortunate that we have this timeline that doesn't match up. And I would like to know what you think about it and what you think I have discovered there, if anything at all. But it's fun for me to share when I discover things. And it was just that tying in of the Dan Wooten article and then the docuseries, what Megan said, and then against that, the backdrop, backdrop of distrust and even the Queen sweeping the room. And, you know, it really is a very, very dramatic story. Now, it's really interesting that Harry is really damning of all the courtiers when in regards to the Sandringham Summit. But in Valentine Lowe's book, he points out that there was a lot of goodwill when the courtiers first sat down to work out five options they could present to the royal family for the Sandringham Summit, they were really trying to come up with workable solutions because they thought this is a good thing for the monarchy going forward because there's going to be maybe instances later on where maybe some of Prince William's children, you know, the spares, don't want to necessarily work for the royal family and they want to do their own thing. So this could be a blueprint or a way of moving forward, uh, sort of a a framework that could be handy to be used in future years. So they were really trying to come up with something that was really innovative and workable. And the only thing that made it all fall down was the commercial deal aspect. That was where the Queen just completely bought. She wasn't against Harry and Meghan moving to a Commonwealth country. She wasn't against them continuing with the Royal Sussex Foundation and their charity work. She wasn't against them coming back to the UK for sort of signature events. But what she couldn't reconcile was commercial deals being made and using their royalty in order to be attractive to people for those royal deals. Because the main thing she feared was the same thing with Wallace and Edward, was that in the end, they were being paid to attend dinner parties. It really got that tacky. The old Edward and Mrs. Simpson were actually paid to turn up at things and to be the quasi-royals at, at a dinner or a function. And the Queen didn't want that to happen with Harry and Meghan. 
because, you know, forewarned is forearmed, isn't it? And she'd seen it all before. Let me know what you think I can't wait to hear. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you again really soon. Bye. Bye.